Good morning. We want to welcome you to our Sunday worship experience here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. And we're glad you've joined us for this online experience. In just a moment, our praise team is going to lead us in some worship songs. And then we're going to get right into uh, God's Word. But let me begin by uh, opening our service with a word of prayer. Would you join me as we pray together? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you together as the family of God. And Lord, we pray that you will use uh, this worship experience today to touch many hearts and lives and encourage us. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is sovereign, who watches over all the events of our lives. And Lord, we know that uh, this coming week is a very important time, not only in our life, but in the life of our nation. And we just pray that your hand would be upon us as a country. God, that your will would be done and that we would um, uh, be willing to support and um, uh, defend and do anything we can uh, to uh, move forward as a country, uh, not only with a new president or the, a, a president um, uh, who is going to be in place again, but uh, Lord, with this pandemic, uh, we, we know that there are cases that have, um, uh, have the number of cases have uh, risen and uh, there's just a lot going on in our lives and in our world and we just pray that you will find us faithful as the people of God. We love you and praise you and we ask this all in Jesus name. Amen.
In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Good. You're 
Franklin Graham, and first of all, I just want to say thank you for uh, your support of Operation Christmas Child. This is an incredible opportunity to reach children uh, around the world, and especially with 2020, uh, COVID-19. This is the first time in the history of the world where the world has been locked down. It's never happened before. It just makes me think that maybe the Lord Jesus Christ will be coming back soon. And if that's the case, we need to be working even harder now than ever. And we need your help. We need your prayers. We need your support as we reach out around the world in Jesus' name, helping children by giving them a gift, discipling them for those that receive Christ, discipling them in God's word so that they can go out and reach their friends and their family with the truth of the gospel. Multiplication. So thank you for your help. Thank you for your support, your prayers. We got a lot of work in front of us. God bless you. Let's have a moment of giving our tithes and offerings as an act of worship as we usually do. You can give online by clicking the link below this video, by visiting cornerstonegso.org, or by texting the word GIVE to 336-565-7577. If giving online is more of a nuisance than a convenience for you, you can always mail a check. Please contact Cindy in our church office and she will gladly answer any questions you may have 
or help you with your giving as we continue to have services online. Let's show people in need that we love them by giving food to Greensboro Urban Ministries Pantry. Leave your donations in our blue barrels before or after you attend worship services this month. Well, let me invite you to take your Bibles and open them to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This morning, I want to look at primarily just two verses, verses 13 and 14, as we talk about hope in the face of death. Um, uh, two weeks ago, um, for two weeks in a row, I uh, conducted funerals for uh, people uh, related to our church. And, you know, I find it interesting that um, when you uh, when I've attended a funeral of a believer or led in the funeral of a believer, that it's both a sad and yet a joyful experience because the believer knows that this life is not all there is. However, I've led some funerals where the person showed no evidence of being a Christian and uh, having been the one to lead in that service, I can tell you that is a sad and very difficult task for any pastor. Friend, you can tell if a grieving family who has lost a loved one is a Christian or not. I can generally tell by the way people weep whether they have hope or not. You see, Christians weep with sadness but they also weep with joy. Our hearts are broken, but we have hope that this is not the end, that death, the experience of death is not final. That's the reason that we can call a believer's funeral service a celebration. We celebrate the life they lived and the hope that we have in the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection as a result of his resurrection. Friend, the centerpiece of Paul's instruction to the Thessalonians concerned the imminent return of Christ. The context of both letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, reveals that the Thessalonians' belief um, was that Christ would come in their lifetime. But Jesus was not coming as quickly as these believers expected. And they were undergoing severe trials and persecution. To make matters worse, some of their members, some of their fellow believers were dying. And questions flooded their minds. Would those who died share in the rapture when Christ appeared? Will they share in the glorious reunion of living believers with Christ? And what about their bodies? If their souls are in heaven, will their bodies remain in the grave? All kinds of concerns about the resurrection arose in the minds of those Thessalonian believers, just as they do in the minds of believers in every generation. Maybe you've asked some of those same questions. Well, I hope today that um, the Holy Spirit can use me to answer some of your questions. So let's look. Paul reassured these Thessalonian believers that their family members, their friends, those fellow believers who had already died would definitely be resurrected and take part in the rapture when Christ appeared. So they were not to grieve as others who have no hope. Yes, we grieve when loved ones die, but we have hope. Here's what I want you to take from the message this morning. When Christians die, we have hope of being resurrected. In these two verses, we discover three reasons why Christians can have hope when facing death. First of all, we know ahead of time what happens at death. Look what Paul writes there in verse 13. He said, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. 
Since grief was based on ignorance, Paul comforted them by giving them knowledge about the death of their loved ones. Everyone is curious to know what happens after someone dies. I read about a little boy who wrote a letter to God. He said, Dear God, what is it like when a person dies? Nobody will tell me. I just want to know. I don't want to do it. Your friend, Mikey. Friend, if you ask some people what happens after you die, they plead ignorance. They say something like, nobody can know for certain. But Paul insists that we can. He says, look him down in verse 15. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. In other words, this was a special revelation God gave to Paul about death and the rapture. During his earthly ministry, Jesus did not disclose details about the rapture. He only referred to it in a general, non-specific sense. For instance, he said in John 14, verses 1 through 3, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Paul's teaching on the rapture is new revelation. The Thessalonians had apparently been informed about the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, but not about the preceding event, the rapture of the church, until the Holy Spirit, through Paul, revealed it to them. Friend, God's Word is clear what happens to the believer after death. The Christian can look death in the face and be confident that death is not final. One of my duties as a pastor is to teach and preach so that you might be prepared for death. We are all going to face death. When family and friends die, we have to walk them through that ordeal. Um, but we will also face death ourselves. In order to be prepared, we must understand what the Bible says about the reality of death and the hope of the resurrection. You know, we can be confident that death is not final because the basis of our hope is that Jesus, in his first coming, destroyed the power of death. In his second coming, he will bring about resurrection. How tragic it is that when a loved one dies that we grieve with no hope. I have seen it firsthand. There is nothing worse than to see someone grieving over a lost loved one who has passed away not knowing what's happening to them or whether they would ever see them again. Friend, without a God-given revelation about death, we are left with only unanswered questions. Where are they now? Is there life after death? Is my brother in torment? Will I ever see my wife, my husband again? The psalmist reminds us that in Psalm 23, verse 4, we will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But in that walk, we can have the God of hope at our side, reminding us that death is not final. Our bodies will be in the ground, but only for a little while. Then when Christ appears, our bodies, the bodies of Christians, will rise from their graves. They will be united with their souls, and we will be caught up together with living believers, with the Lord in the air, and He will take us on to heaven. Friend, that is the knowledge that we have about death. 
Paul says that what he is writing, he does not want these Thessalonians to be uninformed. And that what he is sharing with them is from the Lord. He says, we declare to you by word from the Lord. So we as Christians, unlike the lost world around us, we know for certain what happens when a believer dies. There's a second thing I want you to see here in these verses that give us hope in the face of death. Look in verse, again in verse 13, the latter part of the verse. Here we find that we are asleep in death. Paul refers to those who have died as those who are asleep. Now that word asleep is a euphemism for death. There is a reason the biblical scholars describe believers who die as being asleep. You see, sleep is never final. It's always temporary. Whenever we go to sleep, we always wake up. Just as people wake up from a night of sleep when the morning dawns, Christians will one day awaken from the sleep of death when Christ descends and calls his own from their graves. In the New Testament, sleep applies only to the body, never to the soul or spirit. The spirit of man does not die. Soul sleep, the false teaching that the souls of the dead are in a state of unconscious existence in the afterlife, is totally foreign to Scripture. The word translated asleep has its roots in the Greek word kemai. That word means to lie down. Interestingly, the word for resurrection is also a word that refers only to the body. The word is anatosis. That comes from two Greek words. The first word is histemi. That means to stand. And the other word is ana. That's a preposition which means up. So only the body can stand up in the resurrection. I like the way C.S. Lewis refers to this in his uh, book, The Screwtape Letters. He addresses those who believe the resurrection of believers refers to the soul and not the body. Lewis asks, what position does the soul or spirit take when it lies down in death? Or what position does it take when it stands up in resurrection? To believe in soul sleep, you must explain how a soul can lie down and then stand up. So a sleep refers only to the body. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, Paul wrote, He would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul expressed his desire to depart and be with Christ, for that would be far better. Friend, those statements teach that the spirit of believers, our souls, go consciously into the Lord's presence at the moment of death. For how could unconsciousness be far better than conscious communion with Jesus in this life? The spirits of dead believers are in heaven. I want you to be encouraged today and comforted by the fact that if you've wondered where your loved one is who has died um, maybe just recently or some time ago and you've often wondered where are they now, I want you to be comforted with the truth of the, and the reality that your loved one is presently in the presence of God. The spirit of dead believers are in heaven. We know that because Jesus promised the repentant thief on the cross. In Luke 23, verse 43, he said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So when Christians die, their bodies go into the grave, but their spirits, their souls go directly into the presence of God. They are presently with God and will come back with Jesus at the time of his coming. By contrast, 
When non-Christians die, their bodies go into the grave, but their spirits go immediately into hell. We know that by the parable Jesus uh, spoke in Luke chapter 16. So at death, you don't stop existing. Your physical body simply goes to sleep, but your soul continues to exist in heaven. One day, our bodies will be united with our souls in a glorified form. But for now, the dead Christian's body sleeps until God awakens it at the resurrection. The Romans and the Greeks thought of the place of burial as a scary place full of departed spirits. It was Christians who changed the whole idea of the grave being a scary place. They started calling the place where the dead are buried a coimatorian, which means a rest house for strangers. It's the Greek word from which we get our English word cemetery, the sleeping place. This metaphorical use of the word asleep is appropriate because of the similarity in appearance between a sleeping body and a dead body. Restfulness and peace normally characterize both. You hear people say, I've stood in uh, funeral homes and um, looked and listened as People, especially a family member, will look down into the casket of a loved one and they'll say something like, doesn't she look so peaceful? Well, the truth of the matter is they are at peace. The object of this metaphor is to suggest that as the sleeper does not cease to exist while his body sleeps, so the dead person continues to exist despite his being out of sight. As sleep is temporary, so the death of the body will be found to be. It's also referred to as soldiers' barracks. The only thing soldiers really do in their barracks is sleep. They go to sleep to the sound of taps and they wake up to reveille. Even so, the body of a believer goes to sleep at death when taps is played. I've been at funerals where uh, the, uh, the military, especially if it's a military funeral, they'll have someone out there playing taps at the conclusion of that service. But you can be certain that when the angel blows his shofar, his trumpet, he'll come out of the grave. That loved one will come out out of the grave. That's why the coming of Christ is often called that great getting up morning. Prime Minister Winston Churchill planned his own funeral. There were thousands of dignitaries packed into St. Paul's Cathedral. At the end of the service, a bugler in the top of the dome played a solemn rendition of taps. But as soon as he finished, another bugler positioned on the opposite side of the dome played a spirited version of Reveille. Churchill wanted people to know he believed he would wake from death. Friend, aren't you glad the Bible calls our death sleep? There's nothing scary about death. In fact, when you get tired, you need to sleep. And some bodies get so old and worn out, they need to die. But the person living inside the body goes to be with the Lord. For the person who knows Jesus, their body may be asleep in the grave, but a day of awakening is coming. The Thessalonian Christians therefore had every reason to be hopeful and optimistic. Christians are not to grieve as those who have no hope. A third reason to hope is found in verse 14. We will be resurrected. There are a few words in verse 14 that New Testament scholars recognize as an early Christian creed. Now remember, these Christians didn't have the New Testament yet. So they would often repeat creeds that embodied their beliefs. 
The most famous creed is the Apostles' Creed. We as Baptists don't have creeds. We, we say the Bible is our creed. A creed usually begins with, we believe. Well, here is the earliest Christian creed right here in this verse, verse 14. Paul says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Friend, the basis of our belief about life and death is bound up in that creed. In those eight words, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. We believe that Jesus died. That's important. Jesus was God in the flesh, yet Jesus tasted death. If Jesus hadn't have died, the other part of the creed has no meaning. He rose again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ only makes sense if Christ really died. The solid foundation of our hope is a fact of history. Jesus died and rose again. Through Christ's atoning sacrifice, we are confident that nothing stands between us and God. But our confidence extends to the conquering death of Christ, the conquering resurrection of Christ. Jesus, after death, spent three days in the tomb, but after three days, he stepped out of that tomb in a miraculous, glorious resurrection. And as a result, Paul tells these Thessalonians, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. The doctrine of the resurrection assures us death is not the end. The grave is not final. The body goes to sleep, but the soul goes to be with the Lord. When the Lord returns, He will bring the soul of those who have fallen asleep with Him. He will raise their body in glory, and He will unite their body and soul into one glorious being. Friend, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But while our souls are present with Christ, our bodies will lie silent, sleeping in their graves. That physical part of us will be miraculously raised and transformed on that day when Christ appears. So Christ's death and resurrection provide for our complete salvation, soul and and body, physical and spiritual. That is hope beyond the grave. Chuck Swindoll shares how when he was a kid growing up in Houston, his family lived across the street from a man and woman who married later in life. Mr. Roberts was a wonderful, doting husband who loved his wife deeply. Mrs. Roberts found great joy in the man of her dreams. A sudden heart attack took Mr. Roberts from her, plunging Ms. Roberts into a dark, bottomless hole. In the weeks following the funeral, Mrs. Roberts visited her dead husband's grave every day. There at the graveside of her departed husband, she spent hours talking, crying, seeking solace, grasping for some kind of connection with her uh, departed mate. Instead, her despair deepened, for she had no personal relationship with Jesus Christ, no firm basis for hope beyond the grave. Her futile attempts to reconnect with her departed husband only further confused her and deepened her hopelessness. One day, Chuck Swindoll's mother took a batch of warm cookies and a pitcher of lemonade across the street where she was going to visit Mrs. Roberts. Before she left the house, she asked her son, Chuck, to pray that Mrs. Roberts would be open to what she was going to share with her. That afternoon, Mrs. Roberts embraced the truth 
of Christianity. Because Jesus rose from the dead, death doesn't have the final victory. With Mrs. Swindoll visiting with her in her home that day, Mrs. Roberts gave her heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. But that didn't stop her from continuing her trips to the cemetery. In her graveside visits, she had noticed people weeping over and talking to cold marble slabs, trying in vain to recapture the lost relationship with their loved one, as she herself had tried to do. She understood their despair. But now, Mrs. Roberts held a truth those people desperately needed. Mrs. Roberts became a cemetery evangelist. With her little pocket New Testament and a few chosen words, she would go up to those who were mourning, people who were weeping over the graves of, law, of departed loved ones, and she would comfort them with words of Scripture and speak to them about the hope that we can have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Friend, Paul reminds, reminded the Thessalonian Christians their hope was in the resurrection because Jesus Christ, Christ came back to life, so will all believers. All Christians, though, including those who have already died before Christ returns, will live with Christ forever. From their graves they will come. Martyrs of the faith will rise. Missionary pioneers will rise. Apostles and prophets will arise. Pastors and teachers will arise. Laymen throughout church history who have served the church faithfully will arise. Those who were victorious in their lives, those who were weak in their faith will arise together. The ascending host will include those who were eloquent in speech, who were able to deliver uh, messages that people could clearly understand, those who were knowledgeable in the scriptures, and those who studied scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, knew the Bible backwards and forwards, they would arise. But so would those, so will those who were biblically illiterate. Those who were prayer warriors will arise, as well as those who hardly ever prayed in public. There will be mighty people of God. There will be those who were weak in their faith. They will arise, a countless host, men and women, boys and girls, young and old alike, from every nation, tribe, and language, all washed in the blood of the Lamb on that great resurrection morning, that getting up morning, as it has been called, when Christ appears on the clouds of glory, all of those who have died before that event will rise together and be caught up together with those who are living, and together they will join the Lord in the air and be taken on to glory. Friend, as Paul comforted the Thessalonians with the promise of the resurrection, so we should comfort and reassure each other with this great hope. I hope that you know that your loved one is not just lying somewhere in a cold, dark casket in the earth, but their soul, their spirit are today in the presence of God. And one day they will come with the Lord on the clouds of glory. Their bodies will be raised from those graves. Their soul and their body will be joined together and we will join them and be taken together with Christ and we will live with him forever and ever and ever. Amen.